quite frankly, our leadership is the future. The cardiology community hasn't been very friendly for women. Telling their stories and giving everyone hope is what I'm here to do. There aren't many black gay women in the sports business world. Bow down. Call me your majesty. I go. Let me learn from what happened, the mistakes I made. The needs of women have been under-recognized. Women's health matters. I was the youngest person there. I started live streaming on Twitch. Wherever I am in my journey, it is exactly where I'm supposed to be. These women are changing the world. World Women Hour. 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 World Women Hour.
Women lead with power and lead with confidence and lead with influence. Quite frankly, our leadership is the future. The cardiology community hasn't been very friendly for women. Telling their stories and giving everyone hope is what I'm here to do. There aren't many black gay women in the sports business world. Bow down. Call me your majesty. I go. Zoom, 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 zoom. Call me your majesty. Let me learn from what happened and the mistakes I made. Okay, everyone, if you could please take your seats. Very excited to get started. Okay, but I love the energy in the room. I love the fact that everyone is, is meeting and making introductions, so that's fantastic. So keep that energy, but I'm uh, really delighted for the conversation that is a, about to begin. Okay, everyone, so I am just deeply honored and privileged to be here with the Right Honorable Helen Clark former uh, Prime Minister uh, of New Zealand. She's had an exceptional, exceptional career in leadership, having served in Parliament, having been 
um, Minister of, of Health, Conservation, and Housing. Um, she has also been a leader in the UNDP, and we are really just delighted to have you with us here today, and so thank you so much. I also have to add a, a personal note. In 1992, after uh, living two years and working in Japan, I was traveling, and I um, was very determined to, to get to New Zealand. So when I arrived in New Zealand, I was overwhelmed really by its beauty and I bought a bicycle. And so I spent three months cycling the North and South Islands of New Zealand and it's to this day, it is like the standout uh, travel experience of my life. So thank you so much, it's really such a pleasure. <laughs> I'd be happy to, I'd be happy to. I'm happy to make, make, make New Zealand my next home. So let's jump in and of course, you know, I think one of the, the top, top items that many people are thinking about today is the, um, is the announcement of, of Prime Minister Arden's uh, resignation. Um, and so as of February, she'll, she'll have stepped down. Um, I think many of us, I think all of us in the room, I mean, I'm gonna speak for, for the room, um, have looked at her as just an exemplary leader and has really been um, such a, a kind of a, a standout for female leadership, for not just female leadership, but just leadership and really um, doing so much and doing so much in a really challenging time during COVID. And I think, you know, has been a leader in terms of the approach um, and the strategy towards um, addressing COVID. Um, and one of the things that she said in her, you know, remarks about stepping down is that, you know, she's, you know, her tank is not full and she wanted, she knows that as a prime minister, her tank needs to be full. Um, but as we just sort of were talking in briefly, um, you know, the media is probably going to sort of, unfortunately, you know, misuse what that means. Um, I know you've been, um, you know, since getting up this morning, that's been uh, lots of questions. So if you just wouldn't mind sharing a few of your thoughts. And thank you so much for being here. Well, great, great to be here and good morning, uh, everyone. I did uh, wake about six this morning and I looked at my phone and there were at least 70 or 80 WhatsApp messages and another 40 on text. I thought, has somebody died? And of course it was, everyone going crazy about Jacinda's resignation. Um, so I thought, what can I do here at Davos with my you know, spouse as my secretary? <laughs> so I, I wrote a press statement, sent it to an old press secretary and put my comments on the record because I can't return dozens of calls. Um, but I was very sad to hear the news. If you ask me if I was surprised, no, I wasn't. I have never seen in my political lifetime anything like the level of vitriol and hatred directed towards Jacinda as a young woman prime minister. Never. Now, of course, you know, there's always pressures on you in politics. Believe me, I was nine years PM and it wasn't easier, but it was before social media. The 24-7 uh, news cycle was there, but without social media, it didn't lend to the clickbait, the trolling, the development of really malicious, hating uh, communities. Uh, and she's had to deal with all of that, as well as you know, a series of quite extraordinary crises, which be, began uh, with the uh, horrific murders at the Christchurch mosques by a white uh, xenophobic extremist several years ago, carried on through a major natural disaster which killed many tourists and New Zealanders, uh, and then COVID where she really stepped up to the occasion and you know that first year when there were no vaccines what Jacinda did uh, saved the lives of many of us and believe me I look after an elderly dad who turns 101 on the 8th of March we are grateful for the protection that the old and health vulnerable have had from our government so you know it, it's been a, a tough ride but um, I think she has had you know, amazing success at positioning New Zealand in the world. She's had a major um, and progressive social and economic policy uh, program. And she does leave a legacy. She's not one of those who, you know, was just there for five and a half years and had a lot of photo shoots and the rest of it. She is 
a substantial person. And I really wish her well in, in whatever the next phase of the career is. She's gone with, with no plan. When I left politics uh, uh, in, in 2000, and, well, contested my fourth election, which I, I didn't win, I won three, which is quite good. Uh, when I said I was stepping down, I had no idea what door would open next. So many doors opened, I've been super busy ever since, but, and she'll find that too, because of the talents that, that she has. Uh, but it, yeah, it's a sad day for New Zealand politics, and in my press statement I said, I thought perhaps our society could reflect on the level of polarization and pressure which we place on people in public life. Well, thank you for that, and thank you for, 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 for sharing that. Um, and maybe to follow up, um, you recently commented on the deficit of young leadership in politics um, and opting for fresh perspectives over seasoned ex expertise, yet when younger candidates do run, they tend to lose out because they don't have um, the seasoned expertise. So what experiences should people who are interested in engaging in politics, what should they prioritize on the experience front? Um, well, I think it, it depends on the kind of political system. New Zealand has a, a mixed member proportional system, and if there's anyone here from Germany, that's the system Germany's got. Where about half your, your MPs come from constituencies of some kind, our single member constituencies, and the other half come from party lists. And that is really a big opportunity to have a very diverse representation in, in your parliament because the parties, uh, looking at what they want the overall all composition of their grouping in parliament to be, they've got to focus on gender. They've got to focus on uh, different uh, sectors and sets of, of, of expertise. They must ensure they're inclusive of, in our case, indigenous, ethnic, other uh, uh, groups who are not, not the majority. Uh, LGBTQI also in, in every, almost every political caucus in the New Zealand Parliament now. So it, it's an opportunity for young people who might struggle in a straight first past the post electoral system to emerge as you know the one person who's going to contest the seat, but to come in through the list, which is what Jacinda did by the way. She didn't come in as a constituency member. She came in as a young rising star uh, on, on the party list system. So I would say to, to, to young people, look, look for what the entry points are. Also, uh, service at the, the local government level can be a stepping stone. You can make your mark there uh, and, and you know, look, look for ways in. Look, it's not the only way of contributing to the life of your country, of course, to be a parliamentarian or a local or regional council. It's an important way. There are many other ways as well. But I think uh, with politics, we don't need to see it as a lifelong career. It virtually was for me. But I think we'll see much more now of people coming and going. You know, maybe coming in young, like Jacinda, and then saying, no, that's it. I'm moving on to another phase. We'll see more come in in their 20s. Give it maybe you know, six, nine years, say, right, I've made my contribution. I want to make another one. It, it's not a life sentence, right? And I think uh, tapping... Uh, you know, the, the ideas and energy of youth and innovation of youth I into these, you know, structured systems is pretty important for keeping them relevant. Fantastic. Thank you. So you wrote this wonderful book, a compilation of your speeches, Women, Equality, and Power, and today we're talking about the equality moonshot. Can you sort of You've had such a you know extraordinary life of leadership. You know when you sort of reflect on those your speeches and your 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 time in, in office, and again you know having served in the New Zealand Parliament as the Prime Minister and then in um, UNDP, what are some like uh, the big takeaways that that you have about what sort of stands out from your leadership experience? Well, f firstly, uh, <laughs> these are tough jobs. Uh, they're not for the faint-hearted, and uh, to embark on careers like this, particularly at the time when I did, when there were very few women, uh, it, it requires a, a lot of self-belief and a lot of resilience, and you have to build that, right? You can't let every nasty thing that's said be personally wounding. Uh, so you have to you know, build, build that sort of shell while also remaining open, of course, to comments that are constructive and, and should be uh, taken taken on board. 
Um, I think, you know, for, for women, I mean, Sheryl Sandberg said we have to lean in. Actually, if you look at the corporate world, the evidence is that women do lean in as much as men. They just get a lot more knockbacks, right? Um, and I think when we think about what we can do in support of other women, whether we would agree with their particular beliefs or not, we never want to be part of the knocking machine, right? We need to. We can take on people's ideas, but uh, never, never, never take them on in, uh, as a person, as it as it were. So what I learned along the way was, you know, just sort of building that resilience and, and inner strength to take you through the most difficult of, of, of times. And there's no political career that is just a sort of straight, happy trajectory, right? <laughs> political careers are full of ups and downs and heartbreak. I mean, I, I went into the New Zealand Parliament in 1981. I was one of the 9% of MPs who were female. You know, there were eight of us out of 92. It wasn't very easy. And no one had particular expectations of us. Uh, certainly no one ever thought of a woman being prime minister. Um, but you just had to, you know, stick stick with it and uh, you know, take the opportunities that came to to um, you know go up go up the ladder, as it were. And it was quite a long journey uh, from 1981 to when I became PM in 1999, 18 years. But every single step of that way taught me something that made me a better leader in the end. Yeah, when I was going like, going through your career, I mean, I think just the idea that you served as you know, a minister in housing, health, conservation, like you, you stepped into different spaces, you understood, you know, different sort of challenges that exist. Um, what was, I'm sort of curious in terms of when you think about connecting those dots, and then you went on to serve um, as the lead of the UN, uh, UNDP, what, what, what do you kind of take away from those connections in your career? Well, as, as well as those portfolios, I was also the Minister of Labor, uh, Industrial Relations, in charge of the Accident Compensation Scheme, which is a huge, um, you know, um, no-fault uh, public scheme in New Zealand for people who have accidents. We don't do insurance uh, in litigation. We do no-fault. Uh, so that's a very important part of our social uh, fabric. I've also in my time being the Minister of Security Intelligence and other things that go with being PM, so I've been around. Uh, but also when you move to, to leader level, you take an overview of every level of policy from you know, climate change and you know, laws around um, uh, dangerous dogs and education, but what, whatever it is, you've got an overview because you will be asked anything, right? And you have to know at least a little, a little about a lot. But there were some things I knew a lot about in, in depth because I um, had the ministerial experience. When I went to UNDP, I found that all of this was relevant because UNDP uh, had a portfolio that ranged across um, governance for poverty reduction and human and sustainable development. Well, one thing I knew a lot about was governance. And I came from a, a country which is generally uh, ranked uh, you know, the, the least corrupt or second least or whatever in, in the world we, because we have strong institutions. And if you're uh, the leader of UNDP and you have this you know, important governance portfolio, you, you really have quite a, quite a lot of experience to share as a parliamentarian on the role of parliaments, uh, on integrity uh, in, in government, integrity in public ad administration, accountability uh, mechanisms uh, through the the independent uh, institutions. Uh, so that it was all highly relevant, as was the portfolio work, because UNDP would often be uh, positioned not only close to um, uh, those advising presidents and prime ministers, but also to national planning commissions as they were setting their priorities. So all of the experience in, in governance that I had had was extremely relevant. I've taken that on also into my sort of post-politics, post-UNDP life with other roles I have now. And one of them is uh, chairing the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, which has been going for around 20 years. And its mission is to drive corruption out of the extractive sectors. And as we all know, minerals, oil and gas, there's not a pretty history in a lot of places. 
and a lot of people have been you know, denied the birthright of the resources of their country through straight out kleptocracy, frankly. Uh, so this initiative over the years has developed a standard which is like a convention and countries uh, come in as members to implement this convention. There's around 58 membering, member countries, at least half of which are from uh, the African continent, which is you know, fantastic, people seeing the need to strengthen governance systems. So I still work in this, this sphere through that kind of mechanism today. Thank you, it's a very important space. I, as someone who teaches in the energy space, who's about to next week start the teaching the geopolitics of energy, I'm very familiar and I know the EITI. Uh, so we're almost out of time. In fact, I think we're just out of time. Um, and thank you so much for how generous you've been today. Uh, but could you share with us, we have a full house here, some of the, the best advice that you have received and you know, what can we sort of take away when we think about this equality moonshot? What, what, how do you see that um, coming in to be a reality? Two small questions. Well, yeah, <laughs> two small questions and, and I'll, I'll answer them you know, sort of quite separately. Um, I, I think the best advice I can give is never turn opponents into enemies, right? <laughs> Particularly in democratic societies, we're used to a plurality of views, a range of views, but you cannot turn those who oppose you into, into enemies. One of the devastating things that's happening in, in our Western democracies is this polarization. And uh, some of you might have uh, tuned in or been part of the Edelman breakfast yesterday when they released their trust barometer. And some of these you know, sort of findings that are coming out where people are saying, you know, 80% are saying, I'd, I'd never want my child to marry someone from a different political party, or I, I don't want to be in the same workspace as someone with different... I mean, what are we making of ourselves? We have to have civil discourse, otherwise we, we you know, might as well live in an authoritarian state, really, if we, if we can't manage that. I mean, so don't make opponents into, into enemies. Um, secondly, on the equality moonshot, we have to believe this is possible. And we have to believe it's not going to take 132 years as the WEF gender, global gender gap report says, right? We have to believe we can accelerate this. It's going to be a huge heave. The pandemic has been devastating for women. Uh, I do also chair the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn and Child Health. And we talk about the, the triple C crisis, not the poly crisis, which is the cliche here, but the triple C. We say it's COVID, it's climate and it's conflict. And the three together are devastating the lives of women and girls and families every, everywhere, really. Uh, so we're, we're pushing against those, those headwinds. But, you know, also an old saying, it's an ill wind that blows no good, it creates opportunities to press forward. And we have to look for those opportunities and really go after them. Thank you so very much. And on behalf of everyone in this room, we just I would like to just extend our gratitude for you being here and for your really just exceptional leadership that is, I think, a vision for, for how we think about leadership. Um, and now I'd like to invite Rupa, who is the, the president of the Global Women Foundation. Thank you, Excellency, for being here and inspiring us. And every year we have a legacy of presenting the World Women Hero Awards. Last year we presented it to Jane Goodall and the first female president of Malawi, Dr. Joyce ben Benda. And this year we have the extreme pleasure to present you the World Women Hero Award to be because you are the woman in charge leading us to the equality moonshot. Thank you so much. <laughs> Your Majesty. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. And don't Thank give you. up hope. Keep there the faith. You, <laughs> <laughs> you are launching the equality moonshot. We are in sync. Absolutely. Yeah. You're in sync.